Well, good morning, everybody. It is good to see you guys today. Last week, Tiffany and I, we were up in northwest Arkansas. Come on. That sounds like a good time, right? All of you looking for your next vacation, we found it for you, all right? So here's what you do in Bentonville, Arkansas. You go to the Walmart Museum because Sam Walton started Walmart right there in Bentonville. Uh, once you're done with the Walmart Museum, you can head to a Walmart Supercenter, and that's a good time. After you've been to the Walmart Supercenter, you might go to the Walmart Neighborhood Market. You know, you never know. And then after the Neighborhood Market, you're going to get gas in your car at another Walmart facility that I can't even remember its name because it's it, like we don't even have them. Like, it's craziness. But the entire place was just jam-packed with Walmart. And so we had uh, a blast. We weren't really there to visit Walmart, but uh, we, we went up there to Northwest. Arkansas to hang out with some of our new friends over at SoCo Church. This is Pastor Brad and Jessica and uh, Ryan and Casey, and they're leading an incredible church, uh, another ARC church in northwest Arkansas uh, that is as trendy and hip as these guys look. It's incredible to think that there's a whole hipster culture up there in, uh, in Arkansas, but it is. It's true. I was there. I can testify. Uh, and so we went up there, and we wanted to learn. Tiffany and I wanted to learn as much as we could about how to lead and love and care for our church because uh, Tiffany and I have a, a deep desire to see our church be as healthy as possible, to see our church continue to grow and, and reach out in ways that uh, we have not even yet. But there is nothing better, let me tell you, there is nothing better than um, getting on a plane and coming home from Northwest Arkansas and landing in our beautiful area. And we're loving being back with all you guys. And so um, Pastor Justin did a great job last week, didn't he, uh, with last week's message. That's right. Um, we were grateful to hear that. Uh, it's, it was an inspiring message, a timely message. I heard from many of you, you were like, not only did he knock it out of the park, but it was also what I needed to hear in my life right now. And so if you haven't heard it, I want to encourage you to go back and, and check out week four of our Red Letter Challenge. Go ahead and, and do that. But uh, we're in the midst of a series. We're coming, kind of winding down our, our Red Letter Challenge, uh, which is a series that we've been taking a look at Jesus' words in particular. And, and what does Jesus have to say about five key areas, right? And any time that one person says a whole lot around one or two ideas, generally speaking, that means it's very important to them. And so if it's important to Jesus, we want it to be important to us. And so we've been going along with this journey over 40 days. We've been diving in. We've been reading every day. And I had a guy stop me this morning. He goes, hey, listen, I got to tell you, like, I got to be honest. I got to kind of fess up. And I'm like, okay. He goes, I haven't really been reading that well. Like, I haven't been staying up. Like, what should I do? Should I read all of it and catch up to today, or should I just jump in right today? I said, listen, dude, I, listen, we're going to just start right today. So get back in it, get back on the horse today, and if that's you, like if that de defines you, jump right back in with us. We're loving it, and we're going to be wrapping this up in the next uh, 10 days or so, and, and so we're thrilled about that. But Jesus said a few things and it's all based around this one idea that I wanted to share with you. Well, actually, one idea that he wanted us to, to know, and that's from John 10.10. 10. He says all of these things, but he says it not because he wants something from us, but because of what he wants for us, right? And so he says this, very, very true statement. He says, the thief comes only to steal, steal kill, and destroy. But I've come, I've come that you may have life and life to the fullest, what a gift this is, right? Everybody wants to live a meaningful life. And I keep thinking of this, the commercial from about 1987. You guys remember this PSA? I bet you do. I bet you do. I bet, let's, let's do this one together, right? It was, this is your brain. This is your brain on any... Right, exactly. And, and like, this has been so fused into your memory because you saw it all over the place. It's been noted as one of the greatest PSAs of all time, public service announcements of all time. And it's simply because the mindset behind this campaign was this, that if I could show you the negative impact that a decision would have in your life, would you steer clear of that decision? Right? And Jesus is saying a very same idea. He's saying, listen, if I could show you what life without me is like, would you make a different decision? And he's saying, like, any questions? We're like, yeah, we got a lot of them, right? Like, and so we're going to spend this, this amount of time tackling these big ideas about what Jesus has to say of having life to the fullest. 
And I think of a life to the full, or I think of life that has meaning. One of the things that kind of comes to my mind is, is things that suck the meaning out of life, things that, that prevent you from living life to the fullest. And can we all agree that there is nothing more frustrating or nothing that, that drains the meaning out of your life than buying a product that, uh, and then realizing it doesn't live up to the hype all right? Like, I've got beef with the Snuggie, okay? Like, can we talk about the Snuggie? Some of you bought it and you love it. I don't, okay? I don't love the Snuggie. The other thing I don't understand, the air fryer. I, I don't understand that. Is it actually frying or is it not frying? Like, you know, we got beef around this. And, and sometimes, as consumers, we purchase all this stuff thinking it's going to change your world. And then we have what? Buyer's remorse. Exactly. Buyer's remorse. It's a real thing. In fact, there's laws based around it that you have a certain period of time in order to return something because of that, that decision, because it's so common. See, we understand this because consumption, when you and I, when we live a life that is based upon consumption, consumption actually drains us of meaning. Is it possible? I want you, I want you to think about this for a second. Is it possible that, that marketers and, and businesses of all kinds, they understand this, that consumption drains us of meaning? And so what they do is we have this thing called planned obsolescence, where something that you purchase today, it is bound to fail, guess what, in just enough time for you to get the next model. Because do you know what happens? There's something in our psyche that says, wait a second, like there's a newer version of what I just had. Maybe that newer version is gonna make me feel better. And so we keep buying into this cycle of consumption. And this cycle of consumption, it's draining us of meaning. Nobody has ever said, nobody has ever said, I guarantee you, do you know what the most meaningful time in my life was? Like the, the best time, I can't, I mean, it was when I upgraded my iPhone, right? Like that was the best time in my world. And I like, I got in a ridiculously long line at university and, and, and I paid a ton of money in, in the Apple store and I upgraded my iPhone. I felt closer to God. It was awesome. Or, or ladies, like, have you ever said this? Oh man, when I got that new purse, Woo! Uh, the angels were singing and like it was this moment between me and I felt so close to the Lord and filled with meaning. And the, the ladies in the room are like, yeah, I did, right? <laughs> Pick up on it, guys, right? But here's the deal. Consumption drains us of meaning, but generosity fills us with purpose. We know that when we are generous, it fills us with purpose. For example, in uh, 2003, I purchased an engagement ring. And I, I mean, I, I paid as much as I possibly could to get this ring. Like, you know, I wanted to get the, the best ring I could with the money I had. I made a plan. I got extra jobs. I worked two jobs. I worked a night job, this whole thing, in order to save money to buy this ring and be generous and give it to, to my girlfriend at the time, uh, fiance, hopefully, and uh, now wife. I'm going to spoiler alert, right? But so here's the deal. And, and I was like, this thing is burning a hole in my pocket because I, I can't wait to give it to her. Because my generosity was going to change my purpose. The moment that I gave her that ring, the rest of my life would look different, one way or the other. Yes or no, it was going to look different, okay? And, and so it was absolutely going to change the trajectory of my life. Now, I also have the privilege of being the pastor here. And so I, from time to time, have the privilege and the opportunity to represent all of you in your generosity, we had a woman who contacted the church, that, that, uh, a single mom of, uh, with a bunch of kids, and she said, listen, um, we're really struggling to have just basic stuff. Like, we're, we're running out of toilet paper, we're running out of um, soap and shampoo, and, and I'm unable to afford this. And, uh, you know, our church heard this, our staff team heard this and responded, and we were able to purchase all of this stuff, stuff that you and I don't even really think about, but we were able to give that and say, man, we just want to bless you along with some Publix gift cards to take care of the, the needs that you have. And, and I'm telling you that because of your generosity, our staff team is like, man, do you remember? Like when we were able to do this, we're telling stories of how good it made us feel. Nobody's saying, hey, let me tell you about that, that new shirt I bought. You may feel confident in the new shirt, but it doesn't do something inside of you. It doesn't change the way that you live. It doesn't inspire you the very, in the same way that being generous inspires other people. See, we've all spent money on things that we wish we could get a refund on, right? 
Like there's things I can go home today and be like, man, if I could get the cash back on that and that and that, I would be a happy man. We see hundreds of these items that are discarded. Go to the Goodwill. Go check out Salvation Army, right? Like there are things there that the owners have said, this no longer has any value or purpose. It does not add meaning to my life. This morning, I would love for us to think about what if there was more to life than spending? And, and what if, if healthy living was found in giving? Just, just what if? Like, let's, let's follow along with Jesus and the things that he has to say and wonder if our giving can impact the way that others are living. And, and Jesus knows this. He, he knows it, and we're going to find out about it. But this is why he talks about giving so much. It's not because of what he wants from you. It's not because of what I want from you. It's because of what he wants for you, what we want for you. In fact, in Mark chapter 12, we got to turn here. That's page 693 in the Bibles around you. I'd love for you to open up the, those Bibles, and, or you can follow along in the screens over here. But we find that Jesus is teaching a group of people in, in, the, in the temple, and he's sitting there. He's been teaching for a little bit, and, and they've been asking him questions and going back and forth. And, and then Jesus kind of pauses steps aside, moves to a different spot in the, in, the, in the temple, and he sits down with his disciples. And there is so much for us to learn about this interaction that Jesus has. Take a look at what happens in verse 41. Look at this. It says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put, and he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts of money, right? So here at Hope City, we pass just a plain white bucket, nothing, you know, too significant about it. I know some churches, there may be a box in the back, or maybe, maybe like the church I grew up in, they actually passed like a gold plate, right? Like it was very formal. Uh, I even was at one church where they had this like gigantic stick with a bag on it, and they like shoved it down the row, and I'm like, cool. And you're like, you're able to take stuff out of it. And then they slapped your hand. I don't know. But um, so here at, at Hope City, we passed one of these very plain buckets again, and so Jesus is sitting sort of opposite of where this is being received. And, and he's just, he's taking note. He's just watching what's going on. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I was a lot younger, and actually this is probably true of like last year, um, what I used to do before Christmas would come is I would scour the house for all the change that I could find, right? Because I was going to get mama some brand new shoes, right? Like they wrote songs about this, like her Christmas present came out of the change that I could find. And, and then you'd bring it to TD Bank, right? Because they would cash your change in for free. And, and so I would get this gallon Ziploc bag of change, and, and I've been saving it all year. I found it under the couch. I found it under the car seats. Maybe I, I found it in your house and, you know, maybe you had me over for dinner and I was like, oh, there's some change. I'll pick that up. Uh, and so whatever, I did all this because I wanted to give Tiffany, a, you know, a Christmas present and that was the way I was able to do it. And, and so I'd bring it into TD Bank and be carrying it in. Sometimes it was in a Tupperware container and, and I would get to this machine, right, the coin counter machine, and it would be like, you slam it down on the counter and it make all this noise and you, you get your gallon Ziploc bag open. And then what did you do is you poured it into the machine. And as everybody around the room was like, what is wrong with that cheapskate, right? Like, and, and what is going on over there? And then it starts whirring and the, the machine is working and separating the coins. And in my head, I'm just hearing dollar bills like, yeah, okay, cool. Like this is going to be a good Christmas. And so this is what happened in the temple. These people, they brought in all of this money and they would stand there and they would just slowly pour it in so that everybody else around them could hear what they were giving. They could see, whoa, look at that guy. Look at big spender over there, right? And so Jesus is, uh, he is seeing this. And then another player comes on the scene. Look at this. But a poor widow came and put two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. So here comes this lady, right? And, and she's got something totally different. She actually, uh, she rolls up with her own Ziploc bag, but it's a snack size. Like she's, she's a poor widow that doesn't have quite as much as these other wealthy men. So she rolls up and she's got just two little copper coins. And, and just to remind you how small this is, it was just a, a tiny little bag, two little coins. And she comes over and she just drops them in. I love the artist rendition of this story. If you go on Google, you can search this, The Widow's Might. You'll find all kinds of, of images of this. But I love this painting here. And I love this painting because it reminds us that this woman was, was defined as a poor widow. 
And in this picture here, you see that this woman has is, is got a baby on her hip and a basket on her head. And it reminds us that in this woman's world, work was not optional. To, to be able to take care of herself, to take care of her family, she had to keep working. She was unable to set down the basket, to set down the baby, because there was nobody else to care for her. In this day and age, to be a widow was, mean, to, was meant that you were on the very bottom rung of society. You were the poorest. You were the powerless. You were nobody. Nobody was beneath you. This picture here... Um, it really resonated with me all week long because, you know, you got a, a guy that's coming in with a big gallon Ziploc bag and then this widow that's got two small copper coins. And this guy right over here, you can see his eyes are casting this, this glare at her like, what are you doing here? Right? She's in kind of a, a plain headscarf and all these other guys are, are very ornate and, and elaborate and all these guys have turned their noses up towards this woman. Because the Bible tells us that she had two small copper coins, and, and you can see that actually in, in other, other places it says that it's two little mites, and a mite was one sixty-fourth of a denarius. It was like a, a penny is to, you know, uh, you know, to a dollar or something like that, right? It was a different denomination of currency. And a mite was a sixty-fourth of a denarius, and a denarius was one day's wage. So you would work one day and get one denarius, and, and here she's got one sixty-fourth, and if you do the math, that's the equivalent of about a dollar fifty in today's average wage. She comes, she rolls up with a dollar fifty and drops it in the bucket. And look at what happens. Look at what Jesus does. Jesus, he looks it around and he sees what's happening, and he says to his disciples this in, in Mark chapter twelve, verse forty-three through forty-four. He says, "I tell you the truth." I tell you the truth, this widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. What? Jesus, what? Come on. Didn't you hear them? Like, they made a big noise, and hers was just like a beep. They all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Right? Everything she had to live on. See, this is what you and I need to call God's math. This is what we call kingdom math. Because do you hear what Jesus said? He says, she put more in. And I'm like, no, she didn't. You know, there's no way she put more in, right? Because they were rich, she was poor. <laughs> they were, there was more to value from them, and she only dropped in a little buck fifty, right? But there's more to this story. Because if you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this down, that a sacrificial giving gets God's attention sacrificial giving gets God's attention. Because what was it about this woman that was so special? It certainly wasn't the size of her purse. No, she, she had the, the least amount, right? It, it's what she gave. She gave with what she had. And kingdom math says this, that when you give from everything that you have, that's greater than giving from just one of your checks, one of your paychecks, or one of your streams of income, or just like the, what's left over at the end of the month. See, it's easy for us to give from our leftovers or from our reserves, but what about if we give from the money that we need to live on? There's something about sacrificial giving that gets God's attention. You know what's sacrificial for me? I'll be, I'll be totally honest with you. This is what's sacrificial for me. If I'm at like my favorite restaurant, um, you know, and, and Tiffany looks across the table, we're out on a date, right? Like we're supposed to be spending some meaningful quality time with one another. She looks, I've ordered my meal. She ordered her meal. They come, she looks at my meal and she goes, can I have a bite of that? No, you can't have a bite of that. What are you nuts? You should have ordered it. If, if you wanted this, you should have ordered it. We were at Gecko's the other night, right? And I, I love their, their blue cheese chips. If you ever ha have never had them, got to go try them. And so I order like a little side of them with my meal, right? And so uh, she's like, oh, can I have a couple of those? What? And of course, I'm like, fine. But inside my head, I'm like, why didn't you order some a side of your own? Like, or like, this is ridiculous, right? And it's, I'm telling you that it is a sacrifice for me to give a bite of my meal to her, Right? I don't know. I missed that day in elementary school, but I'm giving her a portion of my food. It feels sacrificial. But guess what? It also gets her attention. It gets her attention because she knows this about me. We've been, we've been married for 15 years and dating for uh, three prior to that. And so when you and I, when we give in a way that says there may not be as much left over for me, 
God's, it gets God's attention. He's like, I see that. I see what you're doing there. And so the question I have for you is, what would it look like for you to give sacrificially? Or, because maybe that's a little bit hard to understand, what if we flipped the question and we said, what is it that God could be asking you to, to, uh, to sacrifice? Like to actually kind of say, you know what, maybe I'm going to shift away from this so that I can be generous. See, look at it one more time. It, it says that they gave out of all their wealth. These rich guys gave out of all their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything that she had to live on. Everything she had to live on, she gave And there's something for us to learn here. And in a consumer culture like the one that we live in, this this may this may change your change your world, and I hope that it does, is that we need to learn that it's okay for our style of giving to impact and affect our style of living. Like it's okay if our style of living is is impacted by our style of giving. Because consumer culture wants us to, to chase down the next experience, to chase down you know, the, the newest car or the next comfort. And, and Jesus is most impressed with who? This poor widow who did this. She trusted God more than she trusted money. And you and I, we need to learn this, that there's a way that makes sense to the world, and then there's a way that makes sense to God. There's a way that makes sense to our culture, and then there's a way that makes sense to Christ followers. There are countless stories of men and women. I could tell them, all day long of men and women throughout history that said, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust his plan for my life, particularly as it relates to finances and provision. And I mean, we could tell stories about, about the way that it's impacted my own life and, and Tiffany and I and decisions that we've had to make. We've had to learn to trust God more than money. And guess what? It doesn't always feel good. It doesn't always feel like it's the right thing to do, but these individuals that get God's attention, they choose to trust him and choose to trust in something that was there long before the American dollar bill ever existed, and long after it it will ever exist. In January of 2017, we started Hope City Church, and it was exciting. It was one of the greatest days of my life. And I remember standing right here on this stage and being like, welcome to Hope City Church. I said it for the very first time. My name is Pastor Peter. We're glad you're here, that whole thing. And I looked out, and I was like, man, this is great. January rolled around, it was great. February rolled around, it was great. Uh, March rolled around, it wasn't as great. A little bit more scary uh, because our operational expenses continued. The lease here at school was, you know, we were paying that. And, and it got to a place where, you know, we actually started to wonder, okay, how is it that we're going to continue to be able to put food on our table at home and like pay for all of the things that, that need to happen? And of course, we're going to keep the lights on here, keep the rent going. Uh, but there was a decision that we needed to make, a decision that I needed to make. Honestly, it was like, this was a moment for me where I was thinking that the, the task that was in front of me felt overwhelming and, and scary. Because I was watching as, as the church's bank account was getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and as our opportunities were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And one Sunday during one of these kind of difficult days, uh, Matt started strumming his guitar and he was leading us in, leading the church in a, in a song called Cornerstone by Hillsong Worship. And I want to share with you the lyrics that have forever rocked my world. It said this, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. And it, it was in a moment that I, I came to the conclusion that I was struggling with where am I placing my trust? Where is, where is my trust going right now? Because I'll tell you this, I knew that this is God's church. This is God's church day in, day out. It is not about me. But guess what? They felt like my problems. Because I was saying, I'm going to trust in myself. I'm going to trust in my abilities to, to be a communicator, to be a pastor, to, be, you know, to lead this organization. I'm going to trust in everything that I have to do. And yet, in that moment, I, I literally, I fell to my knees. And I, in an act of surrender, I just said, God, I trust you more than I trust myself, more than I trust money. And it wasn't easy. It didn't feel good. And I'm telling you, from that moment forward, it's not been like the easiest road that we've ever had to walk. But there will be times when trusting God pushes against your limits. It'll push against your boundaries. It will stretch you and change you and grow you in ways that you never could imagine. And quite honestly, I can't think of anything more filling or meaningful 
than following God and trusting his plan for your life, trusting what he has put in front of you. See, this widow, this poor woman, right? She not only trusted God more than money, but she also shows us one more thing. She shows us this incredible thing, this incredible story here, that if we're going to increase our generosity, we need to be more like this woman. Because this woman, she said, I've got a plan. She had a plan to be generous. And you and I, we could, we could learn this and we could learn from her because what did she do? She, she went in the, in the pantry. She got the, the Ziploc bag out. She gathered up all of her change and it happened to be two little mites, two little copper coins, put it in the bag, zipped it up, and she said, I'm going to bring this. I'm going to bring this and I'm going to put it in the temple treasury. See, this wasn't an afterthought for her. This was, she was prepared. She came ready. And it's so easy for us to fall into the trap, into the rut of saying, you know what, I'm going to be generous one day. Like, I'll be generous when this happens. I'll be generous when this next thing happens or this next kind of career advancement or whatever it may be. And, and then it never actually happens. Because how much more do we actually need to be happy? Just a little bit, right? And then when we get that little bit, it's just a little bit more and then a little bit more and what if, what if we made and created a plan on how to be generous? Now, I told you, I'm basically like a grown toddler. And so when it comes to sharing my meals, that is, that is definitely a difficult thing for me. But I've put a plan around it. I've, I've created a plan on how I can increase my generosity. And it's this. When my meal comes, I'll take a couple bites, not a lot, and then I say, hey, would you like some? Because guess what? there's still 75% left, right? And I feel pretty good when I'm like, here, you can have some, you can have some of the first bites because I'm going to leave all of the rest for later because then I, I can savor that last bite, right? You know, there's nothing like that last bite of shrimp or that last bite of that meal, your favorite meal, and you just savor it. You save it for the last forkful. And, and when, you, when you've already given it away, you get to enjoy whatever is left, I've got this plan, and I put this plan together, and here's what I want. I want Tiffany to notice. I actually want her to be like, you're not really a cheapskate any longer, right? Like, you're not as, as, as like, stingy. And this, the more and more that I work this plan, the less and less stingy I become and the more generous I am. And listen, I know that this is, it's kind of silly. It's 100% true, but it's still kind of silly, but if you and I, if we need a plan for every other area of our life, like if you put a plan together for, uh, you know, how to get, to buy a house, right? Like you, you're purchasing a home, you got a plan together for that. Nobody just wanders into buying a house. Yeah, I'll take that one today. Done. No, you put a plan around it. You, you put a plan around changing your health. You, you come up with a plan with your doctors and your nutritionists and all this about how you're going to do this with a trainer of how you're going to work out in the gym with a coach. You put a plan together. If we plan in every other area of our life, why is it that when it comes to generosity, many of us just approach it like, well, it'll happen. And then we wonder why we're not generous people. Did you guys see this in the news this week? I love this. Check this out. That the Siesta Key Oyster Bar, they came up with a plan. They said, you know what? We see the devastation that Hurricane Dorian caused in the Bahamas, and we want to do something about it. They saw a need they came up with a plan and they executed on it and they've gotten nationwide press around this. And they gave away $15,000. Why? Because they saw, here's what we have in, the, in their bar. They kind of had this like kitschy decor where like you could go and you could staple a dollar bill to the wall. And over time, it, the, the wall in the whole restaurant is covered with dollar bills. And they looked around and they're like, we got to do something about what happened in this hurricane. What do we have? They took stock of what they had and then they, they made a plan, they executed on the plan, and they were generous. They were incredibly generous. And they gave away $15,000. But what would it look like for you and I to take stock of what is it that we have? What resources do we have at our disposal and our availability in order to make a difference and to, to plan to be generous, right? And at Hope City, we want to help you plan to be generous. Because it's... it's in a way, I, I believe this wholeheartedly. This morning, I wake up just like every other Sunday. I wake up incredibly early. I sit at my desk at home uh, with a cup of coffee, and I review my message. I, I make some notes, and I, 
all that kind of stuff. And today I said to myself, you better do the very best job you can with this message. Not because I need something from you. Not because Hope City needs something from you. No, certainly we will grow at the rate of your generosity. We will be able to do more as we collectively are more generous, for sure. But I believe that you and I, we need to plan to be generous because I believe that generosity is one of the most incredible things that we can do to change this world. And if we plant a seed of generosity today, maybe we never see it, but somewhere down the road, when we made a decision to be generous, what impact could that have in the world around us, in somebody's life, in, in, in a location, or in a church, or in a school, or in a community? And I'm telling you, here at Hope City, we want to help you be the most generous that you possibly can be. And so we've created all these different avenues to help you in your plan to grow in generosity. We had somebody that once came and they said, hey, listen, my, my stock portfolio has just gone through the roof, and we want to donate, we want to tithe some of our stocks to you. Great, we're able to do that. We want to help you in that plan. We've got people that say, you know what, I actually want to make sure that on this day and at this time, you know, I want to make sure that the church, that we give of our tithes and our offerings. And so we have ways to have your, your gift be recurring. And it's, it's exactly what Tiffany and I do. Our, we have a plan for generosity in our house. We want to be more generous next year than we are this year. And the year after that, we want to be more generous than we were this year and that year. And so we've decided that we're going to set that up so that the very first thing that happens that hits our account once that paycheck clears, that we give back to what God is doing here in this church and what he's doing in this city. Because here's what we know to be true. Here's what I believe with everything that I have. Again, I don't mind talking about money because I, it's not about me. I'm also not asking you like, sign on the dotted line and make sure that you're giving to Hope City and all this kind of stuff. No, 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 I believe that generosity inspires you. That it is, it's actually about you. It's what we want for you. It's what Jesus wants for you. That generosity inspires you. It honors God and it changes the world. That there's something that, that changes when we're generous. When we use what we have, the, the treasures that we have, the, the talents that we have, the abilities that we have, it changes the world. And something inside of us changes too. Because generosity, it shifts it from being, what's in it for me? To being, well, what's in it for others? What can I do for others? And here at, Sar at Hope City, we have said from the very beginning that we want to be a church that is for Sarasota. We've got that hashtag floating all over the place. You can, you'll see it in our lobbies. You'll see it online. You can't go anywhere without touching Hope City Church and seeing for Sarasota. Because for the longest time, what has the world known? The world has known what local churches are against. We're against this, we're against that, we're against this. And we said from January 2017, we said, no way. We're gonna be the type of church that the community around us knows more what we are for than what we're against. And we wanna be as generous of a church and care for this community and, and God has placed us here because we believe that, that God is for Sarasota. God is for the people of this, of this county. And so we wanna be as well. We don't want just something from you. We want something for you. And so here's what we're gonna do about it. In fact, we were contacted by another organization here in Sarasota County called The Twig. Many of you are familiar with The Twig. They are a foster organization that cares for foster families and the foster children in Sarasota County and, and helps provide a, a meaningful experience where these, these kids can come and they can shop for clothes that they choose, all for free. And every kid leaves with new socks, new underwear. They leave with some shoes. They leave with six to eight articles of clothing that they have picked out on their own and that they feel good about. And they're open every single weekend. Well, we got contacted by them and they said, hey, remember when you donated all those socks and underwear? Well, we're all out. And not only are we all out of that, but we also have all these, these young women that are coming in and they don't only need socks and underwear, they also need bras. And would it be possible for your church to do another Bag of Hope campaign to collect socks, bras, and underwear? Instantly we were like, yeah. Yeah, because that's what Hope City does. We're going to rise to the occasion. We're going to be generous. We're going to care for the foster care kids. We're going to be for Sarasota. And so today on your way out, we're going to hand out all these bags of hope. They're just a, a simple tote bag. 
And I'd ask that this week, as you're out in town, about town and shopping, that you would pick up some, some new socks, bras, and underwear for kids ages 2T on up. And listen, this is a practical way to grow your generosity. Yes, I would love it if you would continue to grow and be generous here at our church, but I want you to grow in your generosity. I want you to grow in your ways to see the needs around you and to meet them with the things that you have at your disposal. God has been so good to us. He's been good to our church, and I know he'll be faithful to us in the future as well. But I can't wait, I can't wait to see next week as we bring back all these things and we're able to bless our community. Because when you and I give, when we're generous, when we grow in that, it inspires us, it changes us, it honors God, and it certainly changes the world.